in considering the relationship between religion and morality, we're now looking at John Arthur's view. And Arthur begins by talking about society and morality and how those are intertwined with religion or unrelated to religion. And one of the main theses is that morality is distinct from religion and it does not rely on religion for its existence. And in order to drive this idea, he kind of does a, a thought experiment where he asks, what would it mean for a society to exist without a moral code at all? What would a society be like if there were no moral principles, if there were no moral concepts, if there were no moral virtues or any related moral language whatsoever? What would that society look like? And to think through this thought experiment, he says, well, to have a moral code is to evaluate the behavior of others and to feel guilt at oneself, when one's own actions, when they fall short of a moral standard. And he says that there would be no guilt if there were no uh, morality, there would be no remorse, no concept of duties or rights or obligations. All of those terms that we talked about that are so central to morality, maybe there would be obligations in the sense of a legal concept, but since our laws are so intertwined with and based on moral principles, it's hard to understand how they, they could be uh, constructed although it's certainly not impossible. So Arthur thinks it's possible that you could have a society without any moral code, but it's very odd to think that there would be a society. So for example, he raises this question, what would it be like to have no property rights? That's a moral concept. If you had a society, but no property rights, I mean, imagine it. So you don't really, you don't own your house. Anybody could come in your house. Anybody could use your, what we now would call your possessions. There, there would be no ownership of cars or, or buildings for that matter. Everyone would have equal access to absolutely everything. And it's kind of hard to imagine a society in that way. Maybe a, a complete and total communistic society, one com very unlike any that we've ever seen on a large scale at least uh, would, would, would include those characteristics. But it, it's very hard to imagine. However, when we're focusing on society and religion, um, it seems like we could imagine this. This would be a much easier scenario and a much easier thought experiment to carry through. We could, there could be a moral society without religion. And he gives a brief definition of religion. Now, this is um, very controversial how you might define religion. His definition is that religion involves belief in supernatural powers that created and perhaps control nature, the tendency to worship and pray to those supernatural forces, and the presence of organizational structures and authoritative sacred texts. Now, since this is not a course on philosophy of religion and not even a section on philosophy of religion, we won't quibble about this definition, but certainly if you were to take other philosophy courses, we might spend more time carefully analyzing whether or not this definition is adequate. But for our purposes, it is. However we define religion, he gives a plausible definition here. He says that there could be morality, that is beliefs about behavior, concepts of rights, moral obligations, sensations of guilt, remorse, and so on, without any religious beliefs. And that seems plausible. Now, uh, just a, a couple points of clarification here. Layman would very likely agree with the thesis that Arthur has laid out as such, that you could have a society without religion, but having morality, and it's hard to imagine a society without morality. So you could have a society with morality and no religion, that seems plausible, 
but it's easy to imagine a society without religion. That seems plausible. Layman, Layman would probably agree with that. However, Layman's claim is a little different than what Arthur is pursuing at this point. Layman's claim is that morality would still be based on the existence of God, even if no one knew or believed that God existed. So uh, just to make sure we're clear on that distinction, consider uh, the heliocentrism, the idea that we have that the sun is at the center, roughly speaking, of our solar system, and the earth revolves around the sun. Now that was true, that was the case, and uh, the, the rotation of the earth is what explained day and night. Uh, the rotation of the earth around the sun explains the changing of the seasons with a, a few other uh, bits of information included, and that's always been true. And yet there were times in human history when no one believed that. No one believed that that was the case, but it was still the case that the earth was revolving around the sun, even though no one believed it. So Layman's idea is that even if no one believed in God, it would still be the case that God would be the basis for morality. So if there was no God though, Layman would claim, um, there could still, people could still feel guilt, they might believe in moral obligations, they still might talk about rights, the language of morality might be there, but those would be false beliefs. In other words, there actually would not be any uh, moral obligations, no reason to feel guilt, and so on. Uh, those are feelings that are not based on truth. So that's layman's perspective on this, and you can see that so far at this point, they're not really contradicting one another. Layman's making a more metaphysical claim, and Arthur is making a more um, epistemological claim about what we can know about morality. And then finally, uh, we should note, to make this clear at this point, Arthur's question is a little different from Layman's main question. So we don't have quite the contrast, at least yet, where one is disagreeing with the other on the exact same question. Instead of whether moral principles themselves are dependent upon God, which was what Layman was interested in, Arthur asks whether religious beliefs about God are the bases for a society's moral code, and that's a different kind of question. Okay, so what might be the connection between religion and morality? These are, are Arthur, Arthur's um, considerations, and we have uh, the first relationship might be that religion might provide motivation for following a moral code. So some might say that religion is necessary in order to motivate people to do the right things, and that's why religion is necessary for morality. Now notice, Layman does not say anything like this. So again, this is not the, the proposal that Layman had, at least. Now, Arthur criticizes this potential connection he says that the difficulty is that religious motives are not the only motives that people have. People have a lot of uh, various motives, and significantly for morality, people are motivated by a desire to maintain a reputation, for example, or a desire to feel good about oneself and not feel guilty. And Lehman, again, would likely agree with this. This is not the suggested connection that Lehman has and Arthur rejects this connection. So they're both in agreement that this is probably not the right way of thinking about the connection between religion and morality, even though some people, in fact, do think this. Neither of our uh, philosophers here think that this is the right connection. Another potential connection is that religion is necessary for providing moral guidance. So the the idea here is that morality is too complex, it's too controversial, there are too many different opinions for reason to clarify what moral principle, principles are. So we need re religion in order to help us understand what are the right moral principles for people to follow. Religious authority is needed somehow to provide answers to difficult moral questions. And so Arthur considers this possibility. 
his criticism here is, well, wait a minute, if, if it's a concern about moral guidance, um, reason is still going to be needed to identify which religious authority one should follow, for example, how to interpret authoritative texts or edicts. So even if one says that religion it can provide the moral guidance, Arthur says reason is still going to be part of the equation and it's still going to be needed. And certainly there are religious figures and leaders who have had really bad moral ideas. And so you have to use reason whether or not to follow various religious leaders or not. And the same with the text involved. Now, again, I, it seems that Lehman would probably agree that this is not uh, the best way of thinking about the connection between religion and morality. So Arthur considers one more potential connection where he, he considers the question whether religion is important in a more fundamental sense than the ones that have been suggested so far. And an example that he considers is the divine command theory or what we'll call the DCT. And this claims that without God and his commands, there would be no morality. Now, even though Lehman does not explicitly speak of the divine command theory, this is something very much like what Lehman defends. So now we have a, a place where both philosophers are talking about the same topic, the same issue. This is much more like what Lehman maintained, and there seems to be a clear disagreement here because, of course, Arthur is going to reject this idea, whereas Lehman said that it made much more sense to hold to an idea something like this. So a divine command theory might also add, only by appealing to God can morality have a foundation. Morality does not make sense without God existing that prov who provides a foundation for morality. And uh, one might think of it in this way, if there's a moral law, then there must be a moral law giver. How could there be a law without a law giver is the idea, especially when it comes to morality. Now, a couple responses that Arthur considers uh, to the divine command theory, uh, criticisms of this approach. And some might respond that morality is merely a matter of emotions. And Bertrand Russell is one example of a philosopher who's taken this approach, and several others after him and before him, for that matter, have done so. The idea is that when we say something like, murder is morally wrong, what we're really saying is this is an expression of emotions that we have about murder. So when we talk about murder, that makes us feel bad. When we think about murder or somebody, we hear that some murder has been committed, we feel bad. So we use this moral language to express our emotions that we are feeling. But the problem with this route is that it's some kind of subjectivism to an extreme point of view. So the implication of taking this path would be that people like Hitler didn't do anything morally wrong, just something others that pe other people don't like. It's not like there's really any substantive reason to think that the, the Holocaust was morally wrong. It's just that while Hitler liked it, other people didn't. And morality becomes much more like tastes or preferences for dessert, for example, or, or what flavor of ice cream to have, or, or now the question of whether one wants uh, apple pie or cherry pie is similar in kind to the question of whether one should murder millions or help feed the hungry. as ah, just a matter of preference. Some people like apple pie, some people like cherry pie, some people like to help feed the hungry, some people like to murder millions of people. Now this, I hope, sounds completely implausible. It does to Arthur and it would to Lehman as well. So this does not seem to be an adequate response to the divine command theory. So another uh, potential response to the divine command theory that Arthur raises is that 
he questions how God's commands could provide a basis for morality. How would this work? And so Arthur reflects on this a bit, and he says, if God's all-powerful and morality is based on God's commands, well, God could command things we consider immoral. Um, God could just decree that being cowardly is good. Um, or God could say that we should try to inflict pain on innocent children. And if God's commanding it, that would make it good. And so this is obviously uh, problematic for the divine command theory. So Arthur thinks the divine command theory doesn't make sense uh, on this basis. This is a criticism that he endorses, right? Instead, what Arthur says is it would make more sense to say that God would declare something good because it is, in fact, good in itself, or that God would declare something bad or morally wrong because it is, in fact, morally wrong in itself. And that would be the better way of thinking about the relationship between God and morality. But then notice God isn't providing a foundation for morality. It already exists. And uh, God is just making a, a commandment based on it. So Arthur argues that it makes more sense to think that there is an objective moral code apart from God. And he compares this, he says, just as it makes sense to say that there is an objective logic apart from God. And many theists, people who believe in God, do think there's an objective logic apart from God. So uh, religious people maintain that their faith is, uh, while well, affirming this, um, they say it's not a severe restriction on God uh, for any more than logical restrictions are. So, for example, to say, well, God cannot make a round square. So that must mean God is not all powerful. Well, theists, by and large, would say something to the effect of, well, a round square, by definition, is contradictory. So it is impossible. It is both curved and cornered. And those characteristics are impossible to exist in the same figure. And so what you're describing is an incoherent concept. It, on the one hand, you're saying that this would be curved. On the other hand, you're saying it would have corners. And that's an incoherent concept. So, of course, God couldn't make such a thing. It, it wouldn't make any sense. That's kind of a logical restriction on what God can do. So Arthur is suggesting, well, religious people could accept this view, this criticism, and still believe in God and say, well, you know, it's not that big of a restriction on God just because he has to look at this objective moral code uh, to determine what ought to be commanded. That's just the way it is, it, very similar to how it is with logic. Now, a, a third kind of note to contemplate here when it comes to the divine command theory is that other people do reject Arthur's conciliation with the divine command theory. So Arthur's okay with this, but he's still maintaining, right, that God would not be the foundation, the basis for morality, so that morality could exist without religion or without God. Um, others don't like this um, approach, and they argue that God himself is the ultimate good, and so God is the source of all good, and so the fact that it's good to be courageous and not cowardly is rooted in the nature of God, which is unchanging and eternal, and so, of course, God could not command that somebody be cowardly because that's contradictory with his nature. Since God's nature cannot change, God could not possibly command that someone act cowardly. Now, again, that's the kind of thing that would be investigated much more thoroughly in a philosophy of religion course or, um, well, probably just in a philosophy of religion course. So uh, how do we put these together again, religion, morality, and society? Arthur argues that morality is a social construction. It's not religiously based. And historically, religion has certainly had an influence on morality. So that's a historical fact. And that influence is important. Uh, that's a social influence. Um, and he gives credit, so to speak. So he says, you know, abolitionists, civil rights leaders, 
Um, this would be another example that he didn't use. Uh, people who are fighting against sex trafficking movement have all had uh, strong religious motivations to pursue these, these goals. So William Wilberforce, an abolitionist, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., um, um, other people, uh, groups today uh, fighting uh, sex trafficking, all have a very strong religious motivation to do those things, and those are important and significant and, and uh, do accomplish a lot for society. But Morality has also had an influence on religion. So it often goes the other direction, the other way around. And again, of course, he's maintaining his thesis that you can have morality without religion. Now, finally, uh, he makes a, a few more points um, arguing that morality is social. Um, it's We have a socially acquired language, and so our Language about morality is also socially acquired, so those are intertwined. Uh, morality exists because of society. Morality guides how we interact socially, and so it makes sense that it has a social basis. And we are subject to criticism by others in our society. Again, that tight relationship between morality and society. The point is that when we think morally, we think about how others would evaluate our actions. And that's more of a social thought, Arthur argues. Now that may include God. We might be thinking morally and wonder how God views our actions, for example, but it certainly includes other people as well. And to think morally is to put yourself into somebody else's shoes and then ask, how would they react to what you do? Uh, notice this is a very Kantian assumption it seems very similar to Kantian's first form of the categorical imperative to ask yourself, what if, what if other people acted in this way? How would I respond to them? Do I think this is a good way of reacting? And, but if, as we're thinking in those terms, Arthur says, we're not thinking about religion or the existence of God at all. A final note on Lehman. He would probably agree again because he's agreed that you could have these moral concepts without the existence of God, or at least uh, people could, I should clarify, we could have these moral concepts um, and use them in our language without religion and without religious beliefs, but they wouldn't make any sense unless God existed to give them force, to give them actual existence. And that's where the two disagree.